Be there anyone at home? Is it? Uh, by the saints, uh, tis none other than Archbishop John Whitgift. Uh, your grace, I am most honoured by this most unexpected visit. Truly, tis most unexpected, as I just so happen to be passing by. Indeed, I was riding by in my carriage when I found myself struck ill. My chaplain did suggest I take rest at the nearest residence, which did so happen to be this small dwelling. <laughs> Forsooth, these rooms have the look of a, of a physician's consulting chambers. Mayhap you are a doctor. If that be true, then praise be to God for this happy coincidence. A most fortunate coincidence indeed. I am Simon Foreman, a doctor of astrology and physic. At your service, your grace. Well then, Doctor, um, uh, uh, Doctor Foreman, was it? Uh, perchance you will tell me what ails me. I, I feel a kind of pain and heaviness in my side, and I know not if this be related, but my skin has of late become most unattractive in appearance. Pain in the right side of the body and sallowness of the skin? Her Majesty did remark upon it most wittily the other day at a meeting of the Privy Council. Your face does serve as a warning to us all, Archbishop. Her Majesty the Queen, verily. Uh, a moment, if I may, Your Grace, while I consult the stars. What does cause the suffering of His Grace, the Most Reverend John Whitgift, the Archbishop of Canterbury? You are afflicted with jaundice, Your Grace. Yellow bile has seeped into your skin, causing it to become yellow-hued in appearance. Tis the jaundice, is it? I see. Pray, have a servant boil this pouch of herbs in water. The liquor is to be injected up the fundament once each day. It should draw the collar away from your skin and into your bowels. Uh, William! Excellent. I will have my chaplain see to it. My, my, who do we have here? Before you take your leave, Your Grace, I would have my manservant William let blood from your right arm. Indeed. Very well, then. Before you depart, Your Grace, uh, perchance I might trouble you with a uh, request of my own? Good day, sir. My chaplain will settle payment with you anon. Good day, my lord, and well met. Indeed, methinks I have not seen your lordship since since last year, afore you set off with Sir Walter Raleigh to capture those Spanish treasure ships. Ah, oh, yes. Doubtless you heard what became of that expedition. The town criers called it Raleigh and Essex's gold piracy fail, declaring it the biggest balls up since the English Armada. Aye, twas most ill-mannered of them, if I may remark. Tis all Raleigh's fault, of course. For when I revealed that I had gotten our navigational directions from you, he had our men turn the fleet around and sail in the opposite direction. Twas his navigation that got us lost. Our ships ended up becalmed in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, leaving England undefended. Who is the beef-headed chudlord now, eh, Raleigh? Well, indeed. Of course, Raleigh refuses to apologise, and we are no longer on speaking terms. Alas, tis most lamentable you were unable to use the directions I gave you. Oh. Ah, well now, how may I assist you this day? 
I would have you tell me how I might regain the favour of the Queen. Indeed, it is strange she has not yet gotten over her displeasure, for the incident did occur many months ago, and we had every intention of returning her warships, filled to the brim with gold, I might add. Besides, how in the devil's name were we supposed to know the King of Spain would choose that very same month to invade England? Huh! I have not the power to predict the future. Uh, well, nay, but I have, my lord, if you had asked me to. Verily, it is not to be borne. Only last week, at a meeting of the Privy Council, during a minor disagreement regarding the Catholic rebellion in Ireland, she called me an impudent lordsplainer, whereupon she rose from her chair and mollywopped me in the face. I half drew my sword upon her. <gasps> you mean the Queen? I indeed. Her behaviour was most shocking. I even asked the royal physician whether she may have lost her mind. She is, after all, most elderly. But Mr. Smith assures me she is in very fine health and is in full control of her faculties. Her Majesty's behaviour is a mystery indeed, although mayhap it should not surprise us. A man's reason is oft insufficient to fathom the workings of the feminine mind, and, in such cases, he may have little choice but to call upon divine wisdom. To wit, let us see what the stars can tell us. What must Lord Devereux do to regain the Queen's favour? My lord, the star suggests you may regain the Queen's favour by offering her yours. By offering her my favour? Well, your tender favours, to be precise. God's underlumps! You would have me bed the Queen? Doubtless you have never seen Her Majesty at close quarters. Elizabeth may be in fine health for an old woman, but she is more advanced in years than my own mother. I am afeard the stars are most clear on this, my lord. Indeed, uh, Pluto being coupled with Uranus, aye, tis clear a gentle wooing leading to intimate relations with Her Majesty is your only means of quelling her current animus towards you. I see. Well then, if woo her I must, then woo her I will. If only to regain my influence and ensure the safety of the realm, I must avert my eyes and think of England. Good day, Mistress Payne. How may I help you this day? Blessed day, Dr. Foreman. I am just come from taking my niece to visit Rochester Cathedral. Thomas Blogg is the cathedral's dean, I believe. Know you of Dean Blogg? Aye, I know something of him. Verily, that man is a model to us all. Under his stewardship, the cathedral's decorative furnishings have been stripped away. He has even replaced the silver candlesticks with pewter. Such pious modesty in the sight of God. Has he indeed? How very interesting. And uh, godly, yes. Uh, but what is it that brings you this day? Before I begin upon my business, Dr. Foreman, I must commend you for correctly predicting the sinking of the Spanish Armada. Ah, yes. Twas I who did predict the great storm that sunk the Spanish ships, was it not? I have all thought that careful study of coastal weather patterns may provide... And we must give thanks to God for the divine vengeance he wrought upon the heretics. I did hear that by morning our beaches were verily littered with the corpses of Spanish sailors. Praise be to the Lord, his glory to uh, behold. Yes, praise be. But all the same, you seem anxious this day, Mistress Payne. What is troubling you? Indeed, I am troubled, Dr. Foreman. I fear for the Queen's health. Everyone is saying that as she is exceeding old, she is soon to die. Ah, yes, I quite understand your feelings, madam. How we love our good Queen Bessie. Long may she reign. Uh, but will she? That is the question, is it not? For she cannot live forever, and when at last she does expire, we shall be stricken with such lamentation and grief. Mayhap 
like you, but not I. Elizabeth Tudor is naught but a septed whore, but still a whore who presides over the Church of England and keeps Rome at bay. And without an heir, who knows what manner of foreigner may succeed her when she dies? For all we know, he may flood the land with foul popery. Uh, foul popery? I take it you do not care for dried floral arrangements. Uh, but, madam, surely fresh flowers are more customary at royal funerals. Did you not heed me, Mr. Foreman? I wish to know whether the English throne is safe from a Catholic successor. Ah, yes, of course. Uh, then let us consult the stars. Is our Queen's long reign in danger of ending soon? And, if so, do we risk a Catholic succeeding her to the throne? The Queen's prognosis is good, madam. God will ensure she remains in health for some years yet. And when at last Her Majesty does expire, whomever succeeds her will happily take his place at the head of the Church of England. I may assure you that England will not revert its allegiance to the Church of Rome. Ah, oh, praise be! To know that England shall remain safe from Satan's earthly servants is well indeed. Fare you well, and may God give you a blessed day, Dr. Foreman. Lancelot, Lord, Lord of all blood, Much of it lately spilled in the mud, Had some different choices been made, Might Lancelot have been spared from the blade? Good day, Mr. Moore. How fare you this fine Tuesday? Uh, oh, on my word, you do not look well. Your face is very pale, and I detect a foul odour. Tis true, I fare not well. But there is no reason to be rude about it, Foreman. Sir, I was merely expressing my concern. You appear stricken with fever, and, methinks, an infected wound. I, I shall undo my breeches for you. There, do you see? My, my. I do see. Tis a knife wound by the look of it. The barber surgeon did stitch it up, but now it does ooze this noisome green stuff all over my fine linens. So I came to you. And you were very right to do so. Aye, I was, because I think it only fair that you fix it. After all, this is all your fault, Foreman. My fault? Uh, sir, I do not follow. You told me I had nothing to fear from that wretched maiden's family when I broke off my engagement. But you were wrong. Uh, then I am most sorry for it. I gather the family did not take the news philosophically. Verily, they did not. The maid herself wept, as is to be expected. But the father took it most violently. He called me an oath-breaking chudlord. Whereupon he laid hands upon me and threw me out onto the street. Indeed. But was not the end of it. For some weeks later, I was set upon by the maid's brother and his band of knaves. They left me for dead behind an alehouse. If I had not been discovered by the night watch, I might have died. Ah, sorry business indeed. I will have my manservant, William, clean your wound and apply a balm to it. But... Pray tell me more of your fever. How oft does it come? Well, I did not have this fever yesterday, and I was well enough to go to church on Sunday. Oh, and to the theatre the day before. But Friday last, I was stricken abed with it. Fever this day and Friday last. Hmm. Now mayhap we consult the stars. What kind of fever has Lancelot Moore? You're troubled with the Quartan fever, a fever that comes every fourth day. It's caused by rotting bile. You must abstain from eating pork and any other meats that slow the digestion, and you must not bathe, but have a servant rub your back very vigorously every day until the fever abates. Then what is it that you're mixing for me there? Tis true I am thirsty, but have you no wine you might offer me instead? 
"'Tis an infusion of chamomile, mallow, mercury, and leaves of the black violet. "'William shall be administering it up the fundament. "'Pray lower your breeches, if you please.' Good day, and well met, Lord Archbishop. What a pleasure it is to welcome your grace once more to my humble consulting chambers. Do you ail of something, sir? Nay, I am in good health. I am come for information. Uh, that is, I am come for an astrological reading concerning one of my deans, Thomas Blagg, the dean of Rochester Cathedral. I hear you are acquainted with him, are you not? Yes, so please, Your Grace. I am honoured to say that Dean Blagg is one of my querents. I see. What a remarkable coincidence. Uh, then you may know that Dean Blagg has been petitioning me to promote him to the rank of bishop, specifically to grant him the vacant seat of the bishopric of Salisbury. I wonder if you, that is, if the stars and planets and so forth, might tell me if there be any reason why Thomas Blagg might not be a fitting candidate for such a position of responsibility. I see. Then let us see what these stars can tell us. Should Thomas Blagg, Dean of Rochester, be made the Bishop of Salisbury? Hmm. You must not grant Thomas Blagg the bishopric of Salisbury, Your Grace, for it seems Dean Blagg has been embezzling from the church. He has been removing cathedral furnishings, fine paintings, tapestries, candlesticks and the like, and selling them for his own enrichment, or may have to pay off his personal debts. Verily. Well, I do hear it remarked that the Rochester Cathedral has been looking a little... Puritan of late... Mayhap I shall have my chaplain cast an eye over the cathedral accounts. Before you leave, Your Grace, perchance I may broach a small matter of my own. Methinks you have the power to grant medical licenses, do you not? Uh, although I am an experienced physician, you may have heard of my work during the plague of 1592, for instance, I am not technically licensed to practice medicine. It has been causing some administrative troubles of late. I wonder if your grace might condescend to help me by... You would have me grant you a medical license, would you? Hmm. I suppose that might be arranged. Leave it with me, and I will have my chaplain look into it. I thank you heartily, your grace. Your grace is most generous. All his blood is on the make, may a beaver on the take. Could it be for her family's sake? Seriously, give her a break. God give you good day, Mistress Blagg. Pray tell, what brings you? I would know whether my lover, Owen Wood, is resolved to leave me something in his will. A small legacy, mayhap. A large one. <laughs> I do hope he intends to leave me something. Uh. Owen Wood? He is the Dean of Amar, is he not? But were you not pursuing, uh, Richard Bancroft, the Bishop of London? Aye, and your notion to use Lambeth Palace for an assignation did work wondrous well. We had a small dalliance, the Bishop and I. But tis all over now, for I did end it. Only a small dalliance? Uh, but I thought your plans for the Bishop were larger in scope. In our last consultation, uh, you had me believe you were looking for something more uh, substantial. <laughs> Aye, I was. But I will not lie, I was disappointed. I see. Now perchance we may proceed to this matter concerning Owen Wood. Uh, pray tell, why would you wish to know whether he has included you in his will? Uh, is he gravely ill? 
not presently, but methinks he will be soon, for he has gone to Ireland to join that peacocking mumphead, the Earl of Essex. I see. He has gone to fight in Robert Devereux's military campaign to put down the Catholic rebels in Ireland. But you are being a little harsh, are you not? It is true he has had some bad luck of late, but the Earl is a fine... Oh, a swole-headed failson is what his lordship is. "'Twould not surprise me if he read his map upside down "'and marched his men into a bog to drown. "'Pray, let us do my reading, if you please.' Uh, "'Certainly. "'If Owen Wood, the Dean of Armagh, were to die, "'would Alice Blagg inherit anything from his estate?' "'I am happy to assure you, madam, "'that Owen Wood will not die in Ireland.' Ah, oh, on my honour, that is most reassuring to hear. Methinks. Nay, nay, it is. And even if he were to die, Deanwood has little to leave you in his will. For the star suggest that he has barely a penny to his name. You mean to say Dean Wood has fritted all his money away likewise? Aye, it would seem that you and Mistress Wood share something in common. That is, aside from... Uh... Oh, well, I never. These clergymen. A band of boil-brained chump lords, the lot of them. Almighty God, shelter thy servant's torment's lag. Take him in thy mercy. And shakes hands into him. Good dawning, D. Blag. How may I do you service this day? I hope you will do me service, Dr. Foreman. For at my last consultation, you served me very ill. Ah. Indeed. Your prediction that Raleigh and Essex would succeed in capturing those Spanish treasure ships did put me in a most lamentable position. I had my tailor fashion me these fine new robes, and now I have not the money to pay him for it. Then I'm heartily sorry for it, sir. Though your new robes are indeed very fine. Is that a different shade of black, or...? And I know not how, but my wife Alice has lately learned of our perilous financial situation. Ah, has she? Aye, and she has had me petition the Archbishop for a promotion. "'Tis her reckoning that if I were promoted to bishop, "'the increased living would enable me to settle our debts.' "'That would seem wise under the circumstances. "'And was your petition successful?' "'It was. At least at first. "'Indeed, His Grace did have me believe "'he is minded to make me Bishop of Salisbury.' "'The Bishopric of Salisbury? "'But that is excellent well, is it not?' "'It would be very well, forsooth.' But many months have passed, and the Archbishop gives yet no sign of granting the vacant bishopric to anybody. I see. And he does not say when the matter may be decided? Nay, indeed he does not. Whenever I raise the question with his grace, he says he needs time to consider the various episcopal and doctrinal matters concerning such an appointment. All the while, he has me performing additional duties that I dare not refuse, lest I lose his favour. And Mistress Blag has sent him pies upon numerous occasions. And yet the Archbishop is not moved? Oh, he must be a very hard man indeed, for your wife's pies are well renowned for their powers of persuasion. Now, let us see what the stars can tell us. Will Thomas Blag, Dean of Rochester, be granted the Bishopric of Salisbury? The stars do confirm that you will be granted the bishopric, for you have acquitted your duties well and proved yourself a skilled administrator. Forsooth, I've heard it remarked that the recent removal of some of your cathedral's more decadent furnishings has rendered the cathedral more, well, more suitable for humble worship and sober reflection. Blessed news! And upon which day will I be ordained? 
I must inform Mistress Blag so that she may prepare our household for removal to the Bishop's Palace at Salisbury. Well, I would advise you and Mistress Blag not to act too precipitously. Uh, for the stars indicate that you may need to exercise the Christian virtue of patience as... Oh. Patience? Sarah, do not speak to me of patience. John Whitgift has strung me along for over a year on this matter. A bishop's living is little use to me if I'm to be bankrupted while waiting on it. Lancelot more struck by the muse For his soul is found Found there be no excuse Many do many do choose To And for his verse they turn him to hell Ah, good morrow, Mr. Moore. How fare you this day? Forsooth, I fare very well, for I have become acquainted with the most wondrous of creatures, a lady who has lately been widowed. Ah, let me just take some notes here. Is this one dark or fair? Auburn with eyes of green, mayhap? I do not believe there's yet been an auburn-haired maid. Fie, Mr. Foreman! Prithee show more respect for ladies than to view them as mere collections of physical charms. Beauty alone is of nothing to a man such as I. Nay, my heart does belong to a worldly woman of culture and learning. Her head almost as striking as the soft hair and radiant eyes that adorn it. Indeed, her gift of understanding is so strong she can listen to my sonnets for hours on end. She can, can she? Forsooth, the lady does show great strength of mind indeed. And how might I advise you? I would have you tell me whether I should marry her, for, as you know, I have offered my troth to ladies in the past, and it has not ended well for me. So, this time I did tell myself, Lancelot, you will proceed with caution. You will know the lady for at least a month before you think of wedding her, and then you'll go directly to Foreman for his counsel. Then let us consult the stars now. Should Lancelot Moore marry this wondrous and worldly widow? You must not marry this lady, sir. You are a wealthy man, and she has designs upon your fortune that may result in your untimely death. <gasps> Ye gods! Verily? I am afeard so. You must take care not to let your emotions lead you astray. But she seems so. She told me she... Are you sure? You did not put a planet in the wrong house or what not? Aye, quite sure. Oh, well indeed, tis most lamentable. Oh, what a waste of such fine eyes. Mayhap Emma has a sister. She tries her best. Tis there she tries she tries From being overdressed to poisoning her guests. Ambition, ambition, Good day, Mistress Fortescue. I do hope you may help me, Dr. Foreman, for I am mightily afflicted with fever and pain. Yes, I see. Your face is a trifle red in colour. When did your troubles begin? At a dinner party, perchance? Nay, twas at a luncheon. The one I gave this day. I sought to play a trick upon my friend, Lady Emma Dyer, and I worry God is punishing me for my japery. And what manner of jape did you play on your friend at this luncheon of yours? Pray, describe the ruse to me. Well... I came upon the idea when I took receipt of a trunk full of exotic goods from the New World. Lovely gifts sent home to me by my gallant husband. Know you of my husband, Captain Henry Fortescue? He is a great friend of Sir Walter Raleigh, of course. I, I think you have mentioned him once or twice, madam. 
The trunk contained a parcel of dried fruits, full red in colour they were, and with them a note of warning. On it was writ that these fruits, if not consumed in moderation, can provoke a hot, pricking fever when ingested. Ah, yes. I have read of this fruit in the writings of Spanish explorers. Capsicum Icaramba Mequema is the botanical name, I believe. I am well known for serving the most original dishes at my table. Hence my guests were not surprised when I invited them to try my exotic fruit. I served them each a sweet pie containing one of these, uh, Capsicum... Icaramba Mequema. But I made sure Emma received a pie containing the very largest fruit, and I the very smallest one. I see. You hoped to occasion a fever in your friend while escaping the same fate yourself. And yet this ruse did not succeed, I take it. Nay, it did not, Dr. Foreman. Most of my guests dared only take one bite of their pies before abandoning them, finding themselves unequal to the challenge. But Emma ate hers all up, as did I. I was sure I would be safe, and that she would turn red and begin to perspire most shamefully, but she remained as cool as a cucumber. But I... But you, madam? But I began to feel such pain in my mouth and throat. My face and eyes turned red. Moisture gathered on my brow and bosom, and damp marks appeared on my bodice. I could not conceal it from my guests. T'was humiliating. How distressing for you, madam. Let us now seek a solution to this mystery in the stars. What might explain the Quirant's affliction? One moment, madam, while I consult that Spanish book I mentioned earlier. The one recounting travels in the New World. Ah, yes. That is interesting. What is interesting, Dr. Foreman? The stars say you have quinsy, and this book confirms my suspicions as to what provoked it. Madam, tis not the larger fruits that occasion pain when consumed. Tis the small ones, such as the one you had baked into the pie for yourself. You mean to say the smaller fruits are more dangerous than the larger ones? How strange! Verily, how topsy-turvy! The pain will be gone by the morrow, but in the meantime, you may find relief by washing your mouth out with wine. Burgundy wine? Or will an ordinary claret suffice? Any wine will do, madam. God give ye good even, Mistress Fortescue. Humphrey Bell, who is this comely youth? Merry half a little shy, but pleasing to the eye. His eyes, his eyes, his hair, his hair, his shape, his shape, all his form, so smooth, as he a sweetheart, pray tell us the truth. Good morrow, young sir. Ah, methinks this is your first consultation, uh, Mr. Um... Uh, Humphrey Bell, sir. And how may I do you service this day, Mr. Bell? I want to get lean in that. You wish to become lean, you say? And why would you need to be any leaner than you are now? You do not appear at all over plump. Indeed, you appear to be a young man in the full vigour of health. Yay, but I do the lady parts, though, innit? Uh, you do the lady parts? Oh, I see. You are a player who plays feminine roles upon the stage. Ah, y ah yes, I think I recognize you now. You play for Lord Chamberlain's men, do you not? The company of players led by Will Shakespeare, Richard Burbage, and Will Kemp, among others. Aye, sir. I play for them as a hired man, and next month I'm to play a fairy queen in a play we're doing for Lord Hunston at his daughter's wedding. But boss man Burbage says I'm too plump for the role. Humphrey, you're Girth does make it difficult for an audience to imagine you getting up out of your fairy throne, let alone flying. Hmm, yes, I think I understand. 
"'Twould imperil the audience's suspension of disbelief, "'thus breaking the fourth wall, as you players so call it." "'Ah, sir, indeed. "'Mr Burbage worries much for them scenery walls, "'for he says my rear end is of such a size "'tis liable to smash right through him. "'Anyways, Mistress Burbage told me that to fit into her gowns "'she bids herself chunder after eating. "'Might you give me some and herbs for Mistress that or something?' "'And Mistress Burbage would be Richard Burbage's wife, I presume.' Well, to judge what would be most effective in your case, I shall need to consult the stars. What should Mr. Humphrey Bell do to become leaner? The solution is quite simple, Mr. Bell. If you would make yourself leaner, you have but to eat less. Uh, why would I need a doctor to tell me that, though? I need something to do quicker than that, urgent-like know you what I mean? Indeed. Sadly, I am familiar with the tendency of the young folk of this day to seek quick, easy fixes to their problems. What about Mistress Burbage and her chundering, though? Can I not have what she is taking? Well, there are ways to induce imbalances in your body to purge itself, but doing so is not at all healthsome. For instance, I might have told you of the dangerous practice of taking goodly quantities of prunes and rhubarb to purge from the fundament. But that would have been negligent of me, for as a physician I cannot endorse... Who's a rhubarb? So I just eat them things. Easy. Uh, but, uh... Thank you, Doctor. Give you a good day. Uh, hold, sir. I'd strongly advise against such a... <sighs> Fable. And close to the crowd, nobles like him do fail up more than down. His family's too grand to jail, too rich to jail. But if Essex disobeys the Queen, she'll put him in the ground. Good day, my lord. I must own, your lordship's visit to my chambers does surprise me. For I'd believed, well, indeed, all of England believes, that you are in Ireland at present. Did anyone see me? No? Good. Now, bid your manservant close the shutters. As your lordship pleases. William? William? Uh, pray close the shutters. Yes, all of them. And fetch us some candles. I pray the counsel you give me this day be wise, Sarah, for I find myself in the most desperate of predicaments. Indeed, I pray your advice be wiser than it was the last time. Your suggestion I could jole the Queen with my tender favours. Forsooth, it worked only too well. The old bat took to calling me her best boy, and sent me off on this damnable quest to put down the Irish Rebellion. I know well, sir, for I was part of the great parade down the streets of London to see you off. <laughs> and now you are back from Ireland victorious, are you not? Ah, I see by your face. Not so much. God's breath! Have you seen the Irish? They are savages! That Irish chieftain O'Neill and his band of fen-born brutes are especially bad. Forsooth, they sound most fearsome. Now, tis a mercy you escaped with your life and are now back home safe in England. Nay, I am not yet safe in England, I fear. For when the Queen finds out that I made a truce with O'Neill, heaven only knows how ill she will take it. Even my leaving Ireland without her permission will doubtless vex her. Then the Queen has not been informed of your return? Nay, she knows yet nothing of it. I am at present taking refuge with my sister, the Countess of Devonshire, at her country estate. But I cannot hide there forever. Hence I am come to you this day so that the stars may advise me on how I may extract myself from my current predicament and win back the favour of the Queen. Then let us see what the stars advise. Uh, how might Lord Devereux escape the displeasure of Her Majesty the Queen and regain her favour. The stars foretell of violence enacted by officers of the law. Ah, verily. Tis doubtless a beheading. Forsooth, I do enjoy a good beheading. Well, tis likely to be a trifle more elaborate than that. If the Queen is particularly vexed, it will start with a quick hanging until just before the point of death, followed by a disemboweling and emasculation. Ah, yes, of course. 
whereafter the gentleman is invited to watch his own entrails and privy parts being lightly grilled upon an open fire before he is chopped into four separate pieces. A quartering, I think you mean? Which, as etiquette dictates, are then to be parceled up and sent as gifts to any friends and family members unable to attend the ceremony. Ah, yes, splendid. An execution with all the trimmings. Verily, whilst a simple beheading can be a most elegant entertainment, it is a trifle too, well, continental for my taste. Why, it is oft over in mere moments. Whereas a full English execution keeps one entertained throughout the whole morning. Though I fail to see what this has to do with... God's breakfast! You... you mean... I am the one to be hung, drawn and quartered? Uh, well, yes, very possibly. I am afeard the only course left to you now is to humble yourself before the Queen. The stars suggest you might be able to convince her to look upon you as the son she never had. A naughty, wayward child who has rebelled against his parent. With time and patience, she may forgive you. God's teeth! "'Twas only last year that I was bedding her. "'And now I am to have the Queen look upon me as if I were her own son?' "'Uh, yay.' "'Hmm, then let me think on this. "'Well, to be sure, twould be more pleasant to play the son than the lover, "'and it might even clear the path for the possibility of... "'Yes, yes, methinks this plan may serve me very well.' Good day, Your Grace, and well met. Uh, might I inquire whether Your Grace has made a decision regarding whether to give Thomas Blagg the Bishopric of Salisbury? Ah, yes, Dean Blagg. I had my chaplain look into what you told me regarding irregularities in Dean Blagg's stewardship of Rochester Cathedral. Uh, methinks you said he was embezzling coin and pawning cathedral furnishings, did you not? Well... It seems you did speak true. Oh, indeed? Of course I will make nothing of it, as I wish to avoid the scandal. I merely told Dean Blanc that I could not offer him the bishopric due to various episcopal and doctrinal constraints. Of course. And what problem would Your Grace wish me to address this day? Oh, it is a problem with my other deans. With each passing day there seems to be a new dean at the palace gates, come to petition me for this wretched bishopric of Salisbury. Presently, tis Owen Wood, the dean of Armagh. Since he returned from Ireland, he talks of nothing else. How tiresome for your grace. Indeed. I have told Owen that I am giving his request careful consideration, but in my experience, this only delays a dean for so long. I do have to grant the occasional bishopric, or else my deans become restless. Doubtless, Your Grace. But after what I learned about Dean Blagg, I must take care to exercise caution. Hence, I would have you tell me anything you know, uh, that is, anything the stars reveal, about Owen Wood, that would render him unsuitable to perform the role of bishop. Then let us ask the stars... Is there any reason why the Most Reverend John Whitgift, the Archbishop of Canterbury, should not grant Owen Wood the Bishopric of Salisbury? Hmm. I must advise against granting Owen Wood the Bishopric, for the stars reveal that he has sinned most grievously. Ah, verily. Grievously, you say? I, I am afeard Dean Wood did commit the sin of adultery. Ah, uh, nothing else? 
Uh, "'Twas more than once, Your Grace." Doubtless, doubtless. While I appreciate your most excellent discernment of this information from the stars, I must own that Deanwood's extra-clergical activities are already well known to me. Why, even my own wife has had a tumble with the man. Uh, your Grace, I am sorry. Hold, Sarah. In truth, tis of no consequence to me. What occurs in Lambeth Palace bides in Lambeth Palace, as we like to say. But you are right to remind me of Dean Wood's indiscretions. For mayhap it be not wise to elevate Owen to such a public position as bishop. I do have the reputation of the church to consider. Indeed, Your Grace. I will tell Owen that while I had every intention of granting him the bishopric, my hands are now tied due to various episcopal and doctrinal constraints. Very wise, Your Grace. And one more matter, if I may. Has Your Grace yet had the opportunity to consider the granting of my medical license? Ah, yes, that. Once my chaplain has finished looking into the matter, I shall be giving it careful consideration. Good day. Since God left Alice in the lurch For solution she does search This true, she's the reddit of the church The blood left Alice in the lurch Good day, mistress. What brings you? I am come about my lover who has lately returned from Ireland. Ah, yea, and your current lover is, as I recall... Ah, yes, your lover at present is Owen Wood, the... Reverend Dean of Armagh, is it not? Aye. And according to my notes, you were afeard he might die in battle. Aye, but you were right. Owen did not die. And yet you do not appear to be much pleased he is returned alive. Uh, whatever is the matter, madam? It is being said around the diocese that my lover, Owen Wood, is romantically entangled with two other women. And who might these two other women be? Might one of them be his wife, or...? Of course not. Do not jape with me, foreman. I did hear that one of the ladies Owen is seeing is Mistress Ways, while the other is a certain Anne Hayborn, with whom I am not yet acquainted. I do hear she is a very young and comely maiden, though mayhap a maiden no longer. <laughs> I prithee, scribble one of those doodles of yours and tell me if this be true. Madam... If you will but afford me some silence and calm, I will compose one of my doodles, as you so call my mathematically precise astronomical charts, and endeavour to answer. Ah, I have good tidings for you, mistress. Your relationship with Owen Wood is secure. Uh, "'Tis true, he has indeed been conducting intimate liaisons "'with some of the wives and daughters of various deans and bishops, but—' "'So then tis true! "'What a maid-fiddling maggot of a man is he!' "'Aye, but prithee, madam, I, I had not finished. "'The stars suggest that Dean Wood's affairs with these women "'will shortly end, for it seems he is in dispute with them.' "'What, with all of them? At the same time?' It would seem so. Mayhap they all have been apprised of the same rumour that brings you this day. Well, I am glad to hear these affairs are soon to be ended. But I will not lie, I am no less vexed with him. And indeed, if Owen has been larking about, it is only fair I do the same. To even things out between us. Ah, I think what you may be referring to is Lex Talionis. It is the law of retaliation, as practised by the ancient Babylonians. Well, madam, indeed, if it would help square matters betwixt you and Dean Wood, you may consider me wholly at your service. Ah, 
<laughs> God give you good even, Your Grace. I trust you were pleased with the previous counsel I gave you? The advice I gave against granting Owen Wood the Bishopric of Salisbury. Ah, yes. Your counsel did indeed prove sound. For Dean Wood is now cods deep in scandal. The parish council has received numerous paternity suits, and tis said that scores of defiled wenches throng the gates of his deanery each morning, clutching suckling babes and demanding recourse. As for young Anne Hayborn, she has had her reputation ruined, and Dean Ways is barely speaking to his wife any more. On my word, how disgraceful. Aye, indeed. If only Owen had the sense to exercise more discretion. Ah, uh, yes, indeed, Your Grace. The Bishop of London, for instance, manages his affairs very quietly. I might have been able to look the other way, but in this instance I could not let Owen's indiscretions pass. For a wretched local woman by the name of Mary Payne got wind of the scandal and stirred up a public fuss about it. Oh, the devil take the woman and her bacon-faced husband. If I might venture an opinion, Your Grace, mayhap if we were to pay no heed to Mary Payne and her ilk, they would eventually tire of their animus and leave us all be. Uh, but is it upon such problems you come this day, or upon some other matter? I am come about my health. I believe I do ail of something. Then pray, describe your complaints to me, Your Grace. Well, I am afflicted with pain in my back, and at times I find myself hard of breathing. Indeed, I feel I may have phlegm in my chest, and I do bear these odd-looking spots upon my body that will not mend. Uh, if you will permit me to loosen your robes to examine you? Oh, I... I see. Uh, methinks I have a notion of what ails you. Let me confirm it with a reading of the stars. What troubles Archbishop Whitgift? Ah, uh, Your Grace, I know not how to put this delicately. Uh, you have the French pox. I am not sure how this is possible, as you're a man of the cloth. Indeed, mayhap I check the stars again. No need. I did suspect as much. Uh, verily? How astute of you. The French pox can oft be difficult to cure, but in your case it is not far advanced. Uh, this ointment of boar grease and mercury is to be applied to your entire body. It must be rubbed in vigorously to ensure the mercury is well absorbed into the skin. You may then expect to see the sores on your body start to heal within a matter of days. I see. And, uh, I imagine your manservant William will be giving me this treatment? Uh, no, Your Grace. Uh, the grease is to be taken home with you and applied each night before bed for nine days. Mayhap your, uh, chaplain could apply it to Your Grace's body. Ah, yes, a fine idea. I thank you for this treatment, sir. Fare you well, Dr. Foreman. Uh, before you leave, Your Grace, uh, might I inquire again as to the possibility of you granting me a medical license? Uh, Your Grace did mention you would give it careful consideration. Ah, yes, indeed I did, did I not? Have no fear, Dr. Foreman. My chaplain is looking into it. Good day.